Good afternoon or evening and welcome. Kensington Senior Living has seven unique communities, four located in Virginia, Maryland, and New York, and three sister communities located in California. We are truly privileged to support care partners and professionals from coast to coast. Kensington focuses on relationship-based care, care built on the foundation of our promise to love and care for your family as we do our own. That promise was what initially drew me to become a member of the Kensington family as my father lived there for almost seven years. It is programs such as the one you are attending now that are so important for those of us walking through a caregiving journey to hear from expert professionals on keeping us current with the latest advances in care management and treatments of conditions that affect seniors and their families. Today you are in for a treat as Dr. William Monsbach will share with you a New Year's resolution, protecting and improving brain health, really a webinar for everyone. So kick off your new year with new tools to take better care of your brain with CounterPoint Health Services. He will share simple, tangible tips backed by research that you or your loved one can incorporate into daily life. Learn today how to reduce the risk of cognitive decline, identify issues that may arise, measure progress, and implement the 15 for Me program. All of our registrants from today will receive a copy of the webinar in your inbox and links, links to connect you with BCAT and Dr. Monspot. Please share with friends and family. For our guest today, we are thrilled to offer to the first 50 registrants or 50 people that purchased the book, 25% off the BCAT Working Memory Book. We will provide the link in today's webinar and we'll also include it in the follow-up email in your inbox for the next few days. As soon as Dr. Mansbach comes on, I will go ahead and put that link in the chat. Please join me in welcoming Dr. William Mansbach and please share with our audience a few words about yourself. Well, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Kensington. Really nice to be with all of you. I don't know if you can see me or not. I don't know if my video is actually um, activated, but I'm just going to go ahead and uh, and start. So I've been involved in memory care for, for quite a long time. Uh, I have a long history in doing um, research, mostly in trying to understand how we can mitigate uh, the cognitive declines that are associated with illnesses like Alzheimer's disease and even mild cognitive impairment. Um, I'm a clinician also, so I'm used to uh, seeing patients uh, and I do so for uh, CounterPoint Health Services and I'm used to operating healthcare companies. I operate Counter CounterPoint Health and uh, the BCAT Research Center. So today I've been asked to talk about brain health and I'm happy to do that. Uh, it's funny to think about it as a New Year's resolution. I'm not so sure that um, most people think about brain health as a, in terms of a resolution, but to me, it's an excellent idea. So I'm going to um, share with you um, some material specifically on a program that we call um, the Brain Health 7. So a little housekeeping here. I know that people have an opportunity to put questions into the chat box. My plan is to talk for 20 minutes or so uh, on the Brain Health 7 and how to make that part of your New Year's resolution. Um, I'm happy to say then that we'll transition to showing you some video clips, some interviews of people uh, who also are interested in improving their brain health. They're people who have been seen in the uh, Brain Health and Psychiatry Center, which is a clinic in Maryland um, uh, supported by uh, CounterPoint Health Services. Um, you'll be introduced to Ali Breeden, who's a cognitive coach who's worked with these two individuals. Um, and hopefully that will give you a real sense of what it's like to improve your brain health. There's a lot of science there, uh, but with respect to the amount of time that I'm going to have available, I'm going to spend most of it talking about what you can do um, as soon as you're done with this video to improve your brain health. Um, you should know that uh, brain health can be improved whether you have normal cognition, whether you have mild cognitive impairment, whether you have mild stage dementia. A lot of research has gone into this, so I'll be showing you some of this uh, exciting stuff. And then we'll go back to questions and answers, Q&A session that Susan will um, help us with. So we'll begin with this idea of um, 
uh, New Year's resolutions. Um, is, so, so the first thing is, are we very good at keeping any New Year's resolutions? And it turns out that in reality, we're not so great at them. Usually our success rate a year later, so that would be, let's say, December of that uh, next year, uh, success rate is about 9%. By the end of the first week, 23% of people have kind of already stopped going to the gym or doing whatever their, um, their resolution was. By the end of the first month, it's about 43%. So what I'd like to do is, is just point out how you can really succeed in any kind of New Year's resolution, but especially for brain health. Uh, just five easy things to think about. Tie these resolutions to a real need. If you're really concerned about your brain health or if you want to protect your brain as you age, if you have a loved one who's had Alzheimer's disease, for example, and your risk factors are higher, I would say that those are real needs. So doing brain health would be really important in that context. Have realistic expectations. Uh, you know, life life intrudes, things get in the way. There will be obstacles for you to emerge, uh, for you to manage. And it's important that if you if you miss a week, or you miss two weeks, you keep you keep going. Set realistic and small goals, increase them gradually. Um, and then build accountability. So we're strong advocates of cognitive coaching because we found that the science would demonstrate that people not only sustain their uh, brain health practices longer, but actually they, they make greater gains. And we know that from the science, uh, but you don't have to have a coach, uh, but you can instead, if you want partner with a friend, just find some way of building some support around you so you can make these resolutions something that is um, tangible and helpful that is sustainable. I guess we should begin with a fundamental question, shouldn't be, which is really, what is brain health? Brain health can be described in many different ways, um, but mostly it's a pathway to wellness. I don't think there's anyone on this call who doesn't want to um, improve or at least maintain wellness in some ways. Brain health is sort of a technical way of getting there, but what is it? Well, there's this WHO definition that says that brain health is an emerging, growing concept that encompasses neural development, plasticity, functioning, and especially recovery uh, from injury across the life course. I'm not really sure what that means. It's it's a it's a technical term. I'm a brain health expert, memory expert. I'm still not sure what that means. Our view at the BCAT and the counterpoint is that there's positive brain health. And what that implies is that those structures of our brain, those 80 to 100 billion neurons that you have are well-preserved, well taken care of so that they can support memory, strong cognition, and the psychological skills that you use every day. It's a dynamic uh, outcome between heredity and experience um, and it has meaningful application throughout all stages of cognition, even through dementia. One way of thinking about it is it's it's about what I'm born with, the cognitive abilities I just naturally have, and what I actually do with it, that we all have agency or a sense of um, ability to, to make it better in some ways. It's aspirational. It's not like I've achieved brain health, so now I can stop. It's an ongoing dynamic process much like changing how you eat, it's not really a diet, it's a life change, a lifestyle change. It's person-centered, which basically means, you know, it may be different from person to person. Uh, the, the one sort of biomedical aspect of it that I'll bring out is that brain health is very much related to cardiovascular health, and they, they, they affect one another, and perhaps we'll get to that a little bit more uh, as we go through this presentation. What brain health is not is simply the brain training programs. You know, there are many of them that are online brain training, uh, learning. They're described by many different things. <clears throat> Those deal with one aspect of brain health, but please don't confuse that with actual brain health. Brain training is something different. Programs like Lumosity and many other ones may be very helpful for many people, but it's not the same thing as brain health. We think that 
the best way to approach brain health is to embrace seven behaviors. It's referred to in the science as the brain health seven or BH7. It was developed at the BCAT Research Center uh, and the CounterPoint clinical team. I think we can argue that that's the best science that's out there uh, and has strong clinical application. So I'm going to talk about seven things uh, today that I'd like you to really think about uh, as I go through each one of them. <clears throat> So I'll first list the seven, and then we'll talk about them in detail. There are more, of course. There are other things that any one of you could do. But if you wanted to just work on those things that have the strongest science behind them and that are the most accessible for you to do, these would be the seven. And I'll try to quantify them in some way for you. Certainly, if you have questions, put, just put them in the chat box, and I'll get to them at the end of our presentation. First one won't surprise anybody. It's really um, about physical exercise. Physical exercise can be very liberally applied. It could be walking up and down stairs. It could be power walking. I'm gonna show you examples in a little while, um, <clears throat> but it's getting your cardiovascular health uh, challenged a bit, getting your heart rate up a bit. Uh, it does not mean that you have to spend an hour uh, every day in the gym doesn't mean that you have to nearly kill yourself to make sure that you achieve some fantastic standard. It's actually not trying to create a gym rat sort of body. It's basically, what do you need to promote brain health, right? Keeping those neurons in your brain, those brain cells working in an optimal way. 10 minutes a day is sufficient for many people from a brain health perspective. You could do 10 minutes at one time. You could space it out. You can make sure that you get up uh, every hour and walk around for two minutes or walk up and down stairs for, you know, for a few minutes. 30 minutes per day is, is, a, is a better goal, but 10 minutes is a minimal standard. I'll say more about each one of these once I go through all of them. The second one are cognitive exercises. And folks, I'll tell you in the very beginning uh, right now that this is the most challenging and the most difficult because you could be thinking, well, what kinds of exercises actually count? Does doing uh, a crossword puzzle count? Does doing a search count? Does reading a book, learning a language? Uh, so cognitive exercises are very specific in terms of promoting, promoting brain health, particularly improving memory. And we focus in our research center and in our practice on what are called working memory exercises. And working memory exercises are very much about how the brain is able to focus attention to learn a new task in some ways. So most of the things that are out there are not working memory exercise related. I will give you some examples in a little while so that you can choose um, uh, actual cognitive exercises that uh, will, will help. And that if you choose something that doesn't help, it may be fun, but that's an opportunity cost. Third, uh, is centered breathing or meditation. Um, there are specific types of meditation that are um, brain healthy uh, and some that are fun to do and relaxing, but don't have quite the same kind of value. I'll talk about um, specific ones in particular that have uh, very good science behind them uh, and why it's important to try to integrate um, uh, meditation or centered breathing uh, that has a script, something that you hear or sound in some ways, but also something that you can see. So this is putting two different sensory modalities together. I'll try to, to explain why that's important. The fourth one is diet. Uh, there is an awful lot of um, uh, information uh, online and elsewhere about what's an appropriate diet, some debate about that. Mediterranean diet and uh, a heart healthy diet. We have information about that that you can certainly uh, check out. We'll make resources available for you. Fourth uh, is social engagement. 
Um, this doesn't mean just talking to somebody over the phone or just running into people in your neighborhood. This is really about something called meaningful engagement. A meaningful engagement is uh, a social event. It could be interpersonal where there are two people involved or a small group involved, but where a person feels a sense of belonging and identity, where um, the brain is um, generally engaged, activating old memories, using specific social skills. Um, it is interesting to know some of the earliest research that we did, we looked at the role of uh, social support and meaningful engagement in mitigating diseases. Uh, and not only in mitigating diseases, but in um, trying to uh, suppress the intensity or severity of, um, uh, of, of sort of disease symptoms or disease expression. Uh, and the science was 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 interesting in that having at least one confidant where you had at least um, one meaningful engagement a week that was the that was the minimal standard um, was um, buffering or protective of, of of disease and is promotional for uh, for brain health. Uh, the sixth one I'll mention is uh, is mood functioning. So um, depression and anxiety that's sort of uh, mood siblings is kind of how we think about them since they they tend to often co-occur and even when they don't they're relatively common um, it's no secret that since um, covid that uh, rates of depression and anxiety in the general population have actually gone up uh, they were already pretty high uh, so mood regulation is an important part of brain health but maybe in ways that are are less less clear what i mean by that is that um, the uh, neurophysiological reactions of, of, of persistent depression and anxiety uh, impact uh, eventually uh, downchain on, on brain functioning. So, so it's not so much the issue of, do I have depression? It's just making sure that you get treatment for, uh, for mood regulation. Um, you want to be able to suppress those stress hormones like cortisol and, uh, and some of the other ones. And so treating uh, mood issues when they're when they're there is really important, not just for mood functioning and well-being in that sense, but for your brain health as well. Finally, um, <clears throat> and just as important as any of these, is sleep. Sleep is uh, in some ways can be regarded as one of the most important activities of daily living. Clearly, we need sleep in order to survive, but but in a more specific way, what happens during sleep is directly related to our brain health. So we go through um, different stages of sleep, as you know, uh, in stage three sleep, slow wave sleep. That's where we do a lot of um, our, um, I would say, housekeeping. We clear the um, neurotoxins of, let's say, beta amyloid and tau to some extent, but certainly beta amyloid. You may know that in Alzheimer's disease, these toxic proteins are implicated as, if not causal, certainly involved in the development of the disease. If you don't get enough slow wave sleep, we're not clearing um, uh, these neurotoxins and so they can accumulate around the uh, neurons in the brain and that can, be, that can be a real problem. But it isn't just in slow wave sleep. I mean, even in REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, that's very important. Uh, and, and, and here's a little tidbit that you might find interesting. When you learn something new during the day, or maybe right now, if you're learning something new, you're trying to make a new memory. But did you know that there's a second phase of memory consolidation that takes place while we sleep? And that's during REM sleep. So if we don't get enough sleep, we are basically subtracting uh, our brain health. So this idea of getting eight hours of sleep is, is a really good idea from a volume sleep standpoint. If you're having difficulty sleeping, it's important that you address that in some ways. Just some common facts and sort of fiction about these seven behaviors. A common myth is that you need to spend hours in the gym. As I said before, you don't. Just make sure you spend a minimum of 10 minutes. If you can spend 30 uh, every day, even if it's broken up, that would be a good idea. Sometimes it's just the relatively short durations that make a difference. Cognitive exercises, 
Crossword puzzles and brain games lower my risk for dementia. There's zero evidence really that that's the case. Working memory exercises, while they don't necessarily prevent uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease, there's very strong evidence they delay onset. And that is really important. Delaying onset and reducing severity uh, is a key. In terms of center breathing, uh, look, there, there, there is a lot of pushback with center breathing. Some people think that it's just kind of a fluff, but the science actually in randomized experimental design science is very strong. Center breathing has a direct and positive impact on our cardiovascular health. When our cardiovascular health is strong, uh, we lower our risk for cardiac and um, brain um, adverse events like like strokes, right? Or like, you know, a heart attack that would be lower than the brain, of course. So um, it's it's a very important idea. One thing that uh, I actually uh, put this on a slide, it came from a question in one of these talks that I gave from, from the audience about eating out. Should I not eat out because it's hard to eat healthily? It's actually not impossible. You just have to be a little bit more careful about how you do it. Um, high fat and high salts are a problem, but honestly, the biggest thing is portion control. It's okay to go out and have a hamburger, but maybe having um, a hamburger not frequently and maybe not having a milkshake and fries with it might be your ticket in some ways. <clears throat> I mentioned social engagement, very important. Social support is key. Um, so having relationships with people that are meaningful are important, and that's a positive, but in a subtractive way, not having social interactions with people who you don't actually get much from or that you feel like are subtractive to your, your mental health um, is something that you should consider as well. Talked about mood, fu uh, mood functioning. There are people who just get used to being anxious or being depressed. They see it as their normal, but these are treatable issues. And the treatment might be from professionals like myself, but it could also be just doing things like practicing brain health that will improve mood. Sleep, go for eight hours. This idea that I only need five is a myth. Uh, so whether you are uh, 85, 65, 45, or 25, eight hours is really the goal. Now, in life, there are things that do subtract from um, our, our brain health, our ability to function, our memory and so forth. Just gonna list some. Uh, one is just normal aging. Our brains become less efficient as we age. Doesn't mean that we're gonna develop dementia. There are a number of reasons why that is. Uh, it, it follows the second law of thermodynamics, if you're interested, called entropy. Things move toward um, disorganization. This is why doing things like working memory exercises are really important. Poor lifestyle behaviors, that can be many different things, poor sleep being one of them, chronic poor sleep, poor diet, poor physical activity, <clears throat> basically not practicing the, the, the seven brain healthy behaviors uh, would fit into all this. Too much alcohol, um, I'm not saying that a little alcohol is a bad thing because it isn't, but too much is. Untreated depression and anxiety, these are problems. Pathological conditions, this would be diseases or illnesses <clears throat> that maybe not directly uh, or immediately, but eventually can um, limit our brain health need to be controlled. So high blood pressure shouldn't be something that you just, um, just kind of let be decade after decade. And accumulated stress, uh, that's sort of that basket category. It's the most important thing. This is a drawing that Edward Hopper did um, in the 1950s. I like it because it makes me think about the psychology of just emptying your stress bucket every day at some point, if not more than once, just let it go, empty the stress and move on. Okay, very briefly, uh, I'm gonna say something about brain training. It's not the same thing, as I said before, brain health, but you would know about some of these programs. Uh, and I'm always asked, you know, what ones are effective and what ones aren't. I'm not going to speak to that right now, but brain training is sort of one thing that you can do, but it must, to be effective, must really fit in with working memory exercises. 
They talk a lot about building cognitive reserve. This is a technical term. It basically, one way of thinking about it, it's sort of like squirrels, uh, what, hoarding nuts for the winter. It's sort of building cognitive strength so that you can resist in some ways illnesses as they may occur. Uh, there, a lot of research uh, went into that. It is possible to build cognitive reserve. Again, you're going to have to use working memory exercises to do that. One term I want to make sure that I mention, neuroplasticity, because one reason why cognitive exercises in particular can be effective is that the brain has this ability to rewire itself. And by the way, it doesn't stop with dementia. It's just more challenging because there are fewer in volume healthy neurons to work with. But neuroplasticity is a real thing. It's not hocus pocus. And um, if you give your brain in repetitive ways an opportunity to do very specific exercises, you are creating um, new connections among neurons. And that is technically how you improve um, cognition. A lot on uh, the science of brain training. I'm going to skip that for right now because I want to make sure that we have time to um, do the, um, uh, the interview clips and we do the Q&A. Some resources I've been asked to just talk a little bit about that have a lot of science to them. The Working Memory Exercise book, this blue edition on, on the left, is used quite widely. Uh, it's been used in research protocols for quite a long time now good five or six years, very good outcomes for people with mild cognitive impairment, people with no impairment, and even people with mild stage dementia. These are all exercises that went through research protocols, so they, they are, they are um, clinically researched. The book on the right is called um, The Brain Sharp Exercise Book. It's a very different book. It's not um, the kind of exercises you would see in the Working Memory Exercise Book. What we tried to do is create more... Um, uh, familiar exercises, but be able to build a foundation of science behind them. So together, this is referred to as the Brain Health Kit. Uh, I believe Susan had mentioned this uh, in the beginning of the program. Um, you can access them uh, through the enrichvisits.com website, which is, which is below. You can get the Working Memory Exercise book on the left on Amazon as well if you want it. Um, you don't have to use these books. You could use any working memory exercise book that has good science behind it. That would be important. Now, in addition, a very important resource is something called the 15 for me. This is now an app. Uh, it's not widely available for all folks, though it is through the Kensingtons. Um, this is an app that was created um, actually out of, uh, out of the COVID 2021, um, 2022 years in particular. Um, so it's a way of improving brain health and reducing stress. Uh, it's based on the three C's of um, stress reduction and brain health, cardiocognitive center breathing. So when I talked about the seven exercises, the first three are in this particular app. I have to say the science is very exciting about this. This is not an app that is just for fun, although I think it is fun. This is an app that came out of a research center, period. So because it's a BCAT program, it's got to demonstrate um, in an independent way that it actually can improve uh, brain health. So it's, it's an app. These are just sort of some screenshots from it. We can give you more resources about it if you are interested in learning more about it. It's uh, also in Spanish for those who um, might be interested in another language. Uh, it, it incorporates a way of self-monitoring if you want. If you want to keep track of your exercises, you can do that. If you want to take your stress temperature, there's a way of doing that by taking a, an instrument called the MOOD-5 or the M5. There's just a lot of resources on there. There's specific cognitive exercises. All of them are working memory exercises. They are different than the books. They're digital. If you don't want to use them from, a, from an app on your phone, certainly you can use them, if you'd like, from um, a computer. That would be perfectly fine as well. Centered breathing, I just want to say that um, this took as much research as anything else, just trying to demonstrate um, 
what kinds of meditation, center breathing meditation can actually be helpful. I'll point out to you that engage your senses, which is uh, on the bottom right, is different from the other ones. This is one that was um, went through protocols specifically for people who have dementia. We were able to find that we could lower um, some of the dementia-related behaviors, particularly sundowning, uh, late afternoon confusion, um, just so that you know that. There are many cardio exercises that you can use. Um, you can design your own. Now, another resource, two other resources that I'll mention, and then we'll shift to uh, watching uh, the video clips. We wanted to create for anyone um, a way of looking at brain health. And there's something called the Enrich Calculator. It's free, doesn't, doesn't cost you anything but two minutes of your time. And what it does is it assesses um, uh, in two minutes um, a risk for developing dementia. It's not um, an actual diagnostic tool. It just looks at what are some of the basic risk factors. You're welcome to do that. It generates a report. It goes to an email if you want. You can share it with your doctor if you want to do that. Um, it's pretty simple uh, in that way. Uh, finally, I was asked to comment on uh, on the Brain Health As You Age uh, book. This is a book that I wrote with two colleagues. Um, the, the ask from the publisher was, can we create a book on brain health that is a lay book that's not um, particularly technical, that anyone could read, that's very approachable. This is a book that you, you might like. Um, uh, once again, there are many books that are out there. This is a book that... Um, covers a lot of the BH7, the Brain Health 7 um, stuff, um, and a lot of other resources as well. So you're welcome to, to do that. Okay, so I'm trying to be conscious of time. And at this point, I think what I'd like to do is uh, switch over and introduce Allie Breeden, who is a cognitive coach um, at, Cog at uh, CounterPoint and, and, the, um, and the BCAT. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and Allie, you can, um, you can introduce yourself and we'll get going. All right, sounds great. Thank you, Dr. Mansba. Um, so yeah, my name is Allie Breeden. I'm a cognitive coach at the CounterPoint Brain Health and Psychiatry Center and the BCAT Research Center, which are both located in Columbia, Maryland. I've been working with people experiencing cognitive impairment for the last 10 years in both inpatient and outpatient settings. And people living in the community visit our center because they're concerned about their memory or another cognitive domain where they've experienced a change. And then what we do is we try to identify the specific cognitive issues that they're struggling with and create a plan to help them build on their strengths and protect the brain as they age to hopefully improve memory as well as other key features of brain health. So I'm going to share clips in a moment from interviews I did with two clients who have mild cognitive impairment, which is often a pre-dementia syndrome. And they'll be talking about their experience at our center, specifically with our cognitive exercise program. And our hope is that you will learn from them about the importance and benefit of brain healthy behaviors as people who took an active role in improving theirs through the BH7 that Dr. Mansbach talked about, uh, as well as just inspiration and hope that cognitive improvement is both possible and practical. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, my first question will get started. Just tell everybody a little bit about what brought you into our center and what sort of symptoms you were experiencing. Well, it started out where I was just repeating myself all the time because I'd forget that I had already told somebody a, a sentence or something. And my grandchildren started questioning me. Well, they said, Grandma, you just said that. And I said, well, I didn't tell you anything. Mm -hmm. So when it got to the point that my grandchildren and friends and family were always telling me, you've already said that, you've already told me that story. I knew something had to be done. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I came into this program. My daughter found out about it and then she signed me up and, and I've been there since then. 
so you came in and you had your evaluation and you received this diagnosis of MCI or mild cognitive impairment, which is often a pre-dementia syndrome for those who don't know. And you heard this news and it was important to you to do whatever you could to slow down this decline. So we came up with a treatment plan for you and you got to work on a cognitive exercise program and signed up to work with me as your coach. So you received access to our 15 for me app and our working memory exercise book, home edition. A lot of times we call it the blue book. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> and you worked on those because of the science behind their effectiveness. So you talked about, so it was hard at first, but you found ways to work it into your routine. How often do you do these exercises? The books themselves, I keep them by my chair and I still use them at least two to three times a week. Mm -hmm. And usually for about half hour to an hour at a time. Okay. And that's because once I get so involved with them, I don't want to quit. I think, okay, I've got this page. Let's see if we can do another one. Mm -hmm. So it just makes you want to keep working until you realize, hey, I've spent too much time in here. Yeah. And so as you, maybe when you started, you could only do 15, 30 minutes, but now you're able to do longer sessions. Oh, yeah. And we talked about when I remember sometimes in the beginning when you would kind of beat yourself up, I reminded you of Dr. Mansbach's, one of his sayings, he says that you want to work at a level that's challenging, but not frustrating. So he says, frustration minus one. And that's, that's the area that we found for you to work yes. in. Yes. It worked a whole lot better. Yeah. Kind of just learning that it's not about getting them all right. It's not about getting a perfect score. It's it's about the work. It's about the time. That's what matters. But, but when I get them all right now, I'll let you know it. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> and that happens a lot that you get them all right. And so that's well, when we have to make it harder. Well, yeah, and that's what I say. I wouldn't have been this far along, not mm -hmm. even close. I would have been probably in a deeper hole. I probably wouldn't have had the enjoyment I've had this past year by getting better. I've okay. seen things in a whole new light. Things seem so much lighter. Things seem so much brighter because I know that I'm part of it again. So you have access now to our 15 for me app online as well as the working memory exercise book home edition what we call sometimes the blue book uh, and you use those because of the science behind their effectiveness with working memory exercise cognition what was it like when you first started doing those exercises how did it feel to do them um the, the feeling at the beginning was okay i'm going to get some help that these these might help. Uh, mm -hmm. Beginning, I thought, well, some are just too easy or too hard in some mm -hmm. cases. Um, but the the time we spent working with it, we realized that this is something that's going to help me. Um, and just putting the time in uh, to do that and focusing on trying to get uh, my memory and my my brain back. Mm -hmm. uh, what I like about the um, the exercises is they get harder over time mm -hmm. and, and in the beginning it's like oh, you know it's kind of easy but then and now it wasn't so easy before it was very much much a challenge but the more i did them the better i got at them mm -hmm. yeah they're progressive because we always we want to be able to tune the exercises to a person's cognitive level so you perform at a certain level until that's not challenging anymore and then we say oh okay you have to make it harder now. So you do these exercises on your own, but you also, like you mentioned, you recently started working with me every other week as your coach. And the science shows that people can improve with or without a coach. But in your experience, how does coaching supplement the work that you do on your own? It's motivating. 
Mm -hmm. So um, helps me stay with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, gives us more opportunities to, to get sharper. Mm -hmm. Kind of um, maybe it was already part of your routine, but having that consistent scheduled meeting, you might kind of like, in school, you're like, oh, well, I have to see my teacher tomorrow, so I better get this homework done. <laughs> yeah, study up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Aside from the cognitive work, you've really implemented uh, some of those other behaviors as well. What are some non-cognitive things that you've changed that you feel have had a positive impact on your brain health? Um, we've been doing more exercising. Mm -hmm. Um, we have uh, stationary bikes in the house. We do. Mm -hmm. We have, have signed up for a um, um, gym uh, in a, that the local college has that uh, we could join. We did a lot more swimming in the, in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm keeping up uh, golf with my buddies. So that's awesome. So physical exercise. Yep. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, even in the wintertime. That's awesome. Yeah. Kathy, are those habits, those brain healthy habits, is that something that you've incorporated as well? Oh, yeah. I mean, literally, um, you know, when we got our, um, a, a um, another diagnosis from another physician saying that we were headed towards Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. um, they, we became determined that we weren't going to go down that path. Mm -hmm. And um, we had seen you for the initial evaluation. And so we just came back to you because we felt like you gave us the most hope um, mm -hmm. and were willing to work with us and not just say like, here's your diagnosis, goodbye. Um, and so, um, you know, it. I went ahead and retired. I mean, literally I retired because I felt that when I was at work and I came home, Tom wasn't doing anything. And, and this was initially, because initially when he was diagnosed with MCI, he was not the same as he is now. Mm. So he could be very sedentary. He mm. maybe didn't remember what he had done all day. So there's been huge change, you mm. know, in how he is. Like now, I wouldn't think twice about leaving him for the whole day. I know he would do the things he needed to do for himself. I wouldn't need to remind him or make a list or anything or check up, you know, so now everything he does for brain health, I do for brain health. Um, and Alzheimer's does run in my family. Um, my grand, my grandmother had Alzheimer's. So um, I, you know, I know I don't need to go down that path. Everything I've learned along the way with Tom is that you can offset it by doing like that, those seven that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. and, and we changed how we slept you know, plugging in our phones outside the rooms, you know, so we didn't have any kind of computer light. I mean, we've done, like, we go to bed at the same time every night. We wake up at the same time the next day. We always try to get eight, eight and a half hours sleep. We changed so much about how we slept. Eight, we cut out sugar completely. Um, we eat that whole, was hard. yeah, <laughs> that was hard because Oreos were like one of his, like, on his plate, you know, <laughs> things you should have. It's a food group. It's a food group. <laughs> Those so, are my favorite too. Yeah. So, you know, no sugar. We are sugar free. Mm -hmm. And um, we also um, have learned to cook. Yeah. Not great. Um, <laughs> but, you know, basic stuff. And um, we're eating unprocessed foods for the most part um, mm -hmm. and whole, whole foods plant based. Hello. Okay, so hi, Dr. Mansbach, and hi, Allie. You are just hi. the cutest thing ever. I love those testimonials. I just want to share a couple things before we get going. In the chat is the link to purchase the books. You can receive twenty five percent off with code Kensington. So I want everyone to know that. Number two. Allie, can you share how our audience can sign up for your emails? They're the most resourceful. Mm -hmm emails I get in my inbox. And I did take that quick little test. I recommend everyone do. So how do we sign up for emails? Yeah, absolutely. I'll put that link in the chat as well. I think I 
have the ability to do that, or I can send it to you and you can put it in the chat. Um, but it's just on our enrichvisits.com website. It's the same website that the bookstore is on that Susan shared. And at the on the homepage, it just there's a big button that says subscribe. And, and to our audience, you will receive a follow-up email and we'll make sure we put links in, in all that for you uh, with a copy of the webinar as well. Um, and then the 15 for me, I want to get that app. Can I just go to the app store? Uh, not yet. So this is the thing about the science behind all this. We really have have released it in, in, in slow sort of uh, batches. So we started with our commitment to the senior living community. So anyone, for example, who's uh, a, a resident or a family member at a Kensington that has an association with, with BCAT, which I think now is all of them, uh, they can get access to it. For the larger community, we'll have to follow up with them. Uh, it's a little, because they have to get it through us rather than through the app store right now. There's a whole kind of process and all that. So Susan, what I'll say is we'll send more information to people, uh, but that's all we can send right now. Okay, that sounds great. Um, some people, Janelle, I don't know if you're listening, but it says chat disabled. Chat yeah, disabled. just to clarify, Susan, the attendees can see the Q&A, not the chat. So we'll go ahead and put the link in the Q&A for everyone. Oh, okay. oh, well, there we go. Learn something new every day. That's good, right? Yeah, I just learned something. Um, and uh, Calvin asked if he could see a couple sample pages. Do you have that blue book uh, next to you, either one of you? I, I actually do but I don't know how to make sure that you can see it. <laughs> Actually, um, so Ellie, you may not have access to this uh, where you are right now, but we actually, on, on the BCAT website, not on the rich one, um, th there, there's a sample protocol that has several different questions that are on, uh, pages that are on there. So it will give you sort of a flavor of that. So while we go through the, the Q&A, Ellie, you can see if you can find that on the BCAT. Uh, if not, maybe Lynn can, can quickly send it to you. Um, so people can, you know, can take a look at it. Sure. Um, and I just want to say one more thing. Um, people are asking to get the code for the discount and the links. And Janelle is going to uh, put that in the Q&A. She'll copy from the chat and put it in. So uh, be patient. I, I just have one little testimonial of mine to talk about the BH7 is I interviewed a gentleman by the name of Daniel Gibbs. He lives in Oregon. He's a neurologist. He has Alzheimer's. And he said, without any hesitation, that doing these seven modifiable things that you can do, you can't modify your genes, but mo you can modify your lifestyle. He says for sure it declined his progression of Alzheimer's. So I encourage everybody to listen to, to what Dr. Mansbach is doing and the work that Ali is doing. I think it's it's proven. Um, couple questions. Any thoughts on hydrogenated water? Yeah, so talking about um, supplements, let's just kind of talk about supplements. Okay, supplements. Well, that's a and, question and, too. And then we'll talk about you know hydrogenated water. Um, go to go, go to your 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 pharmacy or your grocery store. You're now you're going to see uh, more and more sort of categories of um, OTC things that can help with sleep and help with um, memory and things of like like that. So um, I'm a little old school on the science end of this. So. I always look at what is the evidence for things like hydrogenated water and so forth. So in my view, uh, making sure that you're appropriately um, uh, hydrogenated anyway, making sure that you are, are hydrated, making sure that you have water, making sure that you do all the things that you should do with a normal diet, uh, that's really what the goal is. I think these other things don't really add very much. We don't see in the science literature incremental improvement in that way, with one exception. Sometimes when we take supplements, it makes us feel better, makes us feel like we're going to um, you know, improve our brain health. And that's not a bad thing in and of itself, but let's not confuse that with actual evidence that it will improve our brain health. You know, we all hear these ads about Prevagen, I don't mean to say anything bad about Prevagen, but um, clearly they sell a lot because they, they spend a lot of time, money on advertising. But, sure. uh, you know, and, and then I saw uh, something, uh, the 30-day Alzheimer's diet. I, I don't think we can cure Alzheimer's in 30 days. However, I do believe 100% in the MIND diet 
And uh, we actually work with Annie Penn, the Brain Health Kitchen. So I think that's so yes. important. Although I do yeah. like cheese and she says no cheese, but. You know, um, I, I want to reassure uh, the audience that um, it's okay to not be, uh, this idea of don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. It, it, it's okay to occasionally have uh, food that you just really like, but it isn't the healthiest in the world. The most important thing is that on a daily basis, most of the time that you add things that are healthy, like leafy green leafy vegetables, you subtract things that aren't like potato chips. You can be reasonable. You can do things in moderation. That's really the standard that you're that you're really going for here. It's not making sure that you never uh, eat a French fry uh, or you you know you never have a hamburger. I mean that's that's I mean if you're a vegan, uh, fine. But but I think you get the point. Moderation, sensibility. Do the seven things to the best of your ability, even though you won't get it right. You won't do it perfectly every day. That's okay. I agree. And I actually heard a statistic that the seven things you're talking about, if you can just do 60% of that, that you still substantially lower your risk for brain disease. I think if you can do anything that improves your cardiovascular health, I mean, one way of thinking about it is, you know, we talk a lot about dementia and we talk about the illnesses or diseases that cause dementia. I think most people recognize that Alzheimer's disease uh, explains or causes maybe 65% uh, of all dementia. Uh, dementia syndrome, a cluster of symptoms, it's got to be caused by something, some sort of disease uh, or, or illness. But, but in my view, um, Alzheimer's disease is probably a family of different pathways, different illnesses. And probably all of them are cardiovascular in some ways. So I think it is the most important uh, thing that you can do. And diet has a lot to do with that, making sure that you're eating things that aren't going to um, you know, clutter those, those arteries. You're really trying to do the kinds of things that are going to promote positive cardiovascular health. And uh, Allie, are there any other centers in the New York area? I'm actually not sure. Dr. Mansbach, are you? So here's the thing. There, there are centers. Um, that we don't know of anyone who is doing coaching like this. So, so uh, we do coaching in, in different states because we do them virtually. You oh, know? virtually. So you can, okay. be, you can be in Louisiana if you want to do this. Uh, so our, our, our clients tend to be one of two types. They're either... Um, clinical patients that are that may have MCI, maybe not, but they really want to promote their brain health or what we say their clients. So they're really not here medically. They're here from a, sort of a wellness perspective, right? And, and those folks can be anywhere uh, in the United States. And that work with us through coaching is done virtually. So you don't have to work with us. You can work with someone else. Just make sure that they're uh, certified and well-trained in doing cognitive coaching and that they are introducing the kinds of exercises and behaviors that have science behind them. Um, a few people have asked that they have to use the restroom in the middle of the night. Um, does that eliminate your opportunity for a good night's sleep? It doesn't. Uh, you're looking at, at, at volume sleep. So you wake up. And you go to the bathroom and you come back and you fall. If you fall back asleep, you know, within a few minutes, it doesn't really change the volume at all. And your body is very plastic. What I mean by that, your brain, it knows what stage of sleep to go to. So if you were in stage two and you're on your way to stage three, pretty soon you're going to be, you don't start all over again. I mean, you, you very quickly get to the stage that you, the brain's very smart. It knows exactly what to do. So don't worry if you get up a few times at night, just look at your volumes of sleep. One of the things, Susan, that's interesting from the sleep studies, if you ask people how much sleep that they get, almost always they underreport it. And so you might think you're getting four or five hours, you're probably getting five or six hours. And it's simply because who's aware of that, that stage one sleep, when you start to drift off, you're, you're not watching yourself do it, are you? So you really do get more sleep than what you think. I hope not. And I'm so glad after I use the restroom, I don't have to say, go back to stage two. Yeah, no, you, you, you're, you're all good. <laughs> good, good. Um, 
What AI programs are out there? So this is very interesting. Uh, so there are, they're in a very, I think from, uh, they're in an inchoate or beginning form. So, so this is a question that you should ask in a year. Uh, I mean, it's a great question to ask now, but I can't recommend any of them yet because they're not really scienced yet. There are, there are programs that say uh, we can promote memory or we can promote executive skills or so forth, but there's not much evidence because right now people are just trying to come up with the technology. It is exciting. It is, it's truly exciting. Save that question. And if you bring me back in a year, ask it again, and then I might be able to say, oh, this particular program has good science. This program, maybe not so good science. Well, January is your month. We did January is my month. In January, yeah, you get it in January. Um, I would like to um, talk about one thing. Well, one quick question. Is any of this covered from Medicare? So if you see um, us or someone else clinically, you see a doctor or whatever that's covered with Medicare, coaching generally is not covered by Medicare because there's not a CPT code that's that's actually assigned to it. So uh, it's usually private pay and, and you need to ask the people from the very beginning what it is so that um, there's no surprise billing. I wish it was. Um, and here's another question from Calvin, and I'm going to try to take a stab at it, actually. Maybe Great. Allie and I can do it. Is virtual socialization the same as live socialization? And I'm going to say no. <laughs> but what do you guys think? Go um, ahead, Allie. So those, those clips that I shared were actually part of longer interviews. And that is one thing that I asked is how they felt. Because... Um, the first patient lives in Virginia, or the first client that I interviewed, and we have done all of our sessions virtually. And the second one, he actually lives in Maryland. He lives not far, but we've never met in person. Everything we've ever done with him has been virtual. And I asked him how that was, and he said, it feels like we're in the same room. And that's oh. how I feel doing it as well. I feel like I've met him, even though I haven't. Well, that's great. I love mm -hmm. that answer, Dr. Mansbach. I would say coaching virtual is fine. I, I, I think it really gets it done. There's accountability. <clears throat> there's engagement. It works very well. Outside of coaching, just in your life as one of the BH7, I don't think it's, it's sufficient. If you live in a way where you're so cut off from other people, there's just something about the, the level of engagement and intimacy that can take place when you're actually with the person that, that, that really matters. Now, there, there, there is science that's, that's um, really, I think a lot of it was done during COVID that looked at, what about psychotherapy? Suppose that, that you're seeing a patient you know, who's depressed. Is it the same thing? And it is not. Uh, and and so one preferred model would be you see your provider in person sometimes, and the rest of the time you see them, uh, you know, virtually. You can't always do that. Sometimes it's hard enough to find a provider anywhere, and so even virtually is better than 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 nothing at all. Uh, I just think that that's sort of it's kind of interesting to see how that's evolving. Certainly after COVID. Well, I'm a hugger, so that's that's why I answered the question or at least took a stab at it. And Arlene is asking our last question here, is virtual exercise as good as exercise? She does exercise classes over Zoom. Yeah, Ali, you can since you do a zillion of them, you you can you can comment on that. Um, I'm not sure if she means physical exercise or cognitive exercise. Um, physical exercise. I'm not, I'm not, I've never done that actually. So I'm Dr. Mansbach, what's your. Okay. I think, I think, you know, you can compare virtual to uh, actual or to the alternative. And if you can't do actual, then virtual is better. There is something about being able to be with other people. There are the sidebar conversations for one thing. One of the things that can happen in a virtual world is that it becomes an artifact of this sort of strange technology in some ways. It's not bad, but it's not quite the same thing. If you can, but but look, if it gets you to move your body, what do we say over here, Allie? Move your body, move your mind, move toward other people. If you can get that done in any way, that's a plus. 
Um, I'm going to, first of all, thank everybody for coming and certainly thank the people at CounterPoint and BCAT and Dr. Mansbach and Allie. Um, but I just want to encourage the entire audience that connecting with them, doing some of their tests and getting their books and really starting this process is only going to help us in our journeys. And um, the fact that we can kind of regrow our brain or retrain our brain is so encouraging because with Alzheimer's disease specifically, and I think with Parkinson's and Lewy body the same, they've made so much advances in treatment. And if you can catch it when it's still mild cognitive impairment that Ali was talking about, um, you can really do some things to help your journey with these dreadful brain diseases. So thank you for your work of what you do for everybody and thank the audience and have a safe night and safe afternoon, no matter where you are. Thank you. Thanks for having us. We enjoyed it. Have a good Take evening. Care.